Hey, y'all. I'm Andrea. And I'm Christopher. And we are two friends who think it is vitally important to talk about race in America, but not just America, but talk about race in general. Yeah, and we're recording this podcast about a month after the things that happened on January 6th in the Capitol at the U.S. And call it what you want to call it. It was ugly. Yes. And we've had about a month to process it. And lots of information has come out in the news since then. We have no idea when you'll be listening to this or what's happened since we recorded it. But we thought it was really important to have a conversation about this today because it highlights a lot of issues about racial justice in America. Yeah. And we just really we felt that it would have been disingenuous of us to not talk about it when our podcast is decentering whiteness and clearly things escalated the way that they did at the Capitol because of whiteness and white supremacy and white being at the center of of all of the events and everything that took place. Because if we're all honest with ourselves, we know that if that had been a group of Black and brown and red and yellow people, Asians and Native Americans, it would not, it would have looked so different. And how do we know that it would have looked different, Christopher? Because we had the summer of June of 2020 to see what would happen. Exactly. And it's a stark comparison between how law enforcement and the government responded to each one of those. And for me, as I watched it, it really highlighted the amount of white privilege that not only exists in America in general, but especially that the, I'm going to get political here, okay. Okay. That the last administration fomented in this country for four years. And I'm so relieved and so glad that we are now hopefully on a much more compassionate path towards equality in the future for the next four years. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting, Christopher, because actually when I woke up this morning, Tony and I, we were laying in bed, still laying in bed, and we were talking, and he just said, you know, he was like, the best thing that could have happened to America, and and he was born in Haiti, but he is a citizen, but he's seen, like, guerrilla warfare, and he's, he's seen political regimes crumble and all of that being from Haiti, and the history of Haiti is so powerful. But anyway, he said the best thing that could have happened for the world, not just America, is for them to take away Trump's Twitter account, because there is now a calmness in the air, because we don't have to worry about what he's going to say and 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 what he's going to incite in in a moment like like this especially with you know his own his impeachment trial going on but to that point when we talk about it is impossible okay it is impossible to talk about politics or talk about racism and not talk about the politics that support a racist system. And America, racism in America, at least, and I can't really speak to other countries. You can probably speak to racism in other countries from your white perspective better than me because I've never lived in other countries, right? But the way that racism continues is two ways. Number one, it's in the heart of people, right? We know that to be true. It's in the heart of people. But number two is the systems or lack of systems that are put into place. Because when we look at June 2020, the summer, George Floyd's death, eight minutes and 46 seconds, where a white officer put his knee on the neck of a black man who cried out and said, I can't breathe. You're hurting me. But that wasn't the first time we heard I can't breathe. Remember, we, we've heard that before. Right. So it's not new. It wasn't new. But this is proof of a systemic issue, right? And so we have this this upswell of people who were just like, for a lot of people, although for Black people, Christopher, we're like, okay, this has been happening. But for a lot of people, that was their first time, like, seeing it. No filter, no anything. And because of that, People took to the streets because that's where change happens. It's at the grassroots movement. 
And we saw people peacefully protesting. We know that it was peaceful because people literally had their cell phones. Thank God for technology, right? People had their cell phones and other people were proclaiming like, hey, we're not doing anything. Like, don't, don't do that. And yet you hear the from the peppers, the bullets being, you know, shot at them and people running away. Right. And these people were truly peaceful. And then you have this, like, I guess maybe juxtaposition, if you will, where these people are angry. They built nooses or a noose on the grounds of the United States Capitol. Okay, like in real time, Christopher, they built a noose and it was there for all the officers and everybody to see it because we're on this 24 hour news cycle, right? And yet the National Guard or the Capitol Police, they still were not called in. But you've got a group of, let's say, 300 people protesting peacefully. And you've got the entire National Guard with army tanks in little old cities. But yet in Washington, D.C., where everything is supposed to be copacetic and thousands of not just white people, but angry white people who fundamentally believe in conspiracy theories, let's just call it what it is, they fundamentally, I believe that they believed in their hearts that Trump won the election, right? And they're angry. And Christopher, you got nothing. There's no National Guard. There are police. I mean, they had their little plastic shields, but that was it. They had the little pepper spray. That was it. Well, and then what we ended up learning afterwards is that the reason for that was primarily because a racist administration yes. prevented the DC National Guard from preparing any action ahead of time. Yes. Um, and they had their hands tied and couldn't come out and do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now we're also hearing that even when the president at that time was aware of what was going on, he still was not taking action to stop it. And that's something that's just come out in the last 24 hours and is going to be the subject of some sort of surprise witness testimony in the Senate today during the impeachment trial. Yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'd be careful. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to respond to what you said by the fact that those protests in June of 2020 were not always peaceful. And that's true. But a lot of that. Was no, 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 no. Let me stop you right there. I did okay. say that the protests, all the protests were peaceful. Let me, I did not say all the protests were peaceful. Okay. I said you had people who were peacefully Absolutely. protesting. And we know that they were peacefully protesting because we had people with their cell phones out who showed yep. the crowd of people who were standing with their hands up. And shortly after that, we heard the from the bullets. Yep. The, what do they call it? Who they, sh they shot at the people who had their hands up. That is what I said. I did not okay. say that all of the all right. protests were peaceful. So I just wanted to clarify that because I was, uh, I know that people, a lot of people have an impression that those protests last summer were extremely violent. And there was some violence. There was far more peacefulness, people expressing their rights as American citizens to be in the street and peacefully protest. But Again, let's be real, who perpetrated that violence, though? Most of the violence yeah. that, that happened, who was the perpetrator of that violence? That's where I was going. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So there were probably two primary perpetrators. Yep. First, there were probably a lot of white folk out there to stir shit up. Mm -hmm. And so when we looked here in Phoenix at the looting that took place at one of our biggest shopping malls, et cetera, it's a bunch of white kids that got arrested because they were just taking advantage Yep. of the Black Lives Matters protests as a smokescreen yep. to cause trouble, Yep. you know? And then the other reason is for how many damn centuries can Black people protesting peacefully expect to not respond to violent intervention by law enforcement? Right. When all they're doing is expressing their American rights uh, to First Amendment rights peacefully, in the right time, place, and manner, which are the tests of the law 
And let's be real. Martin Luther King, who is the king of peaceful protesting, was still murdered. They murdered him. And he was a peaceful protester. So let's not pretend for those listeners who are out there who are still saying, yeah, but peace, peace, peace. Let's not pretend that peace is what's going to solve things. Peace, peace is great. And I'm not condoning violence. I'm not for violence. I'm not for rioting. I'm not for looting. But let's not pretend that violence. I want to make sure I'm framing this correctly. Let's not pretend that black people are the first people who invented violence to cause movements. Well, and not only that, but something that occurred to me last summer when all of this was happening was it is not the right of the oppressor to tell the oppressed how to appropriately protest their oppression. Exactly. And if I were a person of color who had been systematically dehumanized right. since the beginning of this country and before, <laughs> yeah. I might be a little bit pissed off. Right. <laughs> I'm, I might break a window or two, okay? <laughs> not, that, not that I'm saying that's right, but any human being who has any emotions whatsoever yeah. can feel into what it must be like. And here you got to, and I'm always saying this, open your heart, open your mind to what it feels like to be part of a group of people who is constantly told you are not human. You are not equal. You don't have the same rights that I do. I'd be pissed off. Who the hell wouldn't? Right, right. And, you know, and I just want to say this because I think it's important for me to say it, especially as a black woman, you know, I'm not mad or angry or upset with the people who who did storm the Capitol, right? Like, I'm not looking at all those white people who stormed the Capitol and like, look at all those bad white people there and, you know, all of that. that I'm not that person. There are people who are like, <laughs> you know, hey, we've been oppressed. We know how it is. I, I could care less. Arrest all of them, right? But my thing is this, and that's and I even said this in the beginning, the people who were there protesting, Christopher, the majority of them fundamentally believe that they believe that that Trump won. Right. They fundamentally believed in their hearts that the election was stolen. But even deeper than that, they fundamentally believe that someone is coming for them, right? They believe that their whiteness is threatened. They believe that this country is going to be taken over by the Mexicans or the brown people because studies have shown, this is scientific, that you know, white people will be the the minority, will be a part of the minority by what, 2050 or, you know, the number changes all the time, right? So these are people who fundamentally believe that their existence, if you will, is at stake, right? And so my thing is this here. If you can fundamentally believe that your existence is at stake, then why can't you offer that same compassion right? And empathy and sympathy and all of that. Why can't you offer that to someone else? And so the conclusion that I've come up with in all my years of of trauma healing and doing the work and working with people is that they can't see beyond themselves because they're dealing with their own unhealed trauma. Yeah. And, and, you and I are prone to this kind of esoteric thinking that hopefully people will understand because it makes perfect sense. Um, but I think, you know, the reason they can't get beyond that is indeed because of whatever trauma they've had that has them need to feel special, yes. unique, in yeah. charge, in control, all the <laughs> things that would make them feel safe. Right. And all of this stuff is, these are false Thoughts. Yes. Right. So, you know, 300, 400 years ago, the primary color of people on (laughs) this continent was brown. Yes. (laughs) And white people came along and decimated them. Yes. 
So maybe are we afraid that people of color are going to do the same to us because we know we did it to them? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Preach. <laughs> that's a crazy thought. You're but, right. You know, at the end of the day, we're all just people. So what happens? Let's let's just think this out. What happens if my children or their children or whatever are living in a majority non-white society? What's going to change for them? Right. And what is the best thing to do about that right now if it is going to change? Right. right. So if it's going to change, you know, are we going to be oppressed? Are we going to do are we going to have all the stuff happen to us that we've been doing to people of color for centuries? You know, if, if so, that's our own damn fault. <laughs> so just, just from a smart chess game perspective, isn't the right thing to do to start getting used to that idea now and start to make friends now so you don't come for me when you're in the <laughs> So that's just game theory thinking. But what that what that really means for all of us is even if you take the most ridiculous and fearful racial arguments, mm -hmm. the answer is still yeah. open your heart, open your mind, begin to change that fixed narrative in your head yeah. about the experience that people of color have in, in, in this America. Yeah. And let's start to create a different America where no matter who's in the majority, it doesn't matter because we're all just human beings who love and have compassion and try and understand one another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad we had this conversation, Christopher, because, you know, like you said in the beginning, this is a month after it happened. I've had time to process. You've had time to process. And we're not even sure when the listeners will be listening to it. But, you know, again, we just really wanted to have this conversation. And it's a candid conversation. We're not going to, you know, ask you to really do anything except, like Christopher said, you know, really open your heart and open your mind. Because this was an amazing learning experience for us to see two different types of protest, right? And to see the police response or the government's response, right? Because it's not just police, it was police, your chief is the mayor, mayor, you know, all of that. But this was a, an amazing teachable moment for us to see how systemic racism, how it looks in real life and in real time. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry for this analogy, but you know how you know, you get a little bit of a, a, a zit, you know, just under your skin right here for a while. And you, no one could see it. No one can feel it. Yeah. January 6th was that mother was blowing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> everything that we've seen below the surface percolating for the last four years. Yeah. You know, we got to see it a little bit in Charlottesville mm -hmm. and we got to see it big and bad in Washington, D.C. And what I hope happened for America on that day is that we got to see the ugliness and the tyranny yes. of this way of thinking. And let's be honest here, the vast majority of people who were participating there are parts of organizations and political parties and ways of thoughts that are fundamentally white supremacist in nature. And even though the a study done by a, by a research institute showed that it was like 9% of people belong to identifiable groups like the Proud Boys and others. 91% of them were business owners and housewives from all the way across America. And let's not forget that there were cops. Yes, as well. And an unequal proportion of former military, current military law enforcement as well. And it just goes to show how that racist mindset, what it eventually leads to. And you gave people a lot of credit for you know, having true, sincere, <laughs> sacredly held beliefs that they had been, the election had been stolen from them. But had it been, had we had the same feeling as we have had in several times in the decades past that elections had been stolen from the That's progressive true. movement, did yeah. we act that way? That's true. No, you're right. You're right. You're yeah. right. I know. That's, that's part of my <laughs> my being one with God and one with everyone. <laughs> That's part of that philosophy. But no, you, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because, yes, the other side, there have been times where 
I mean, the 2000 election where people were like, whoa, I mean, and the Supreme Court intervened. I think you're in Europe at the time. Oh, right? girl, I was paying attention. Like, oh, even, I, I didn't sleep for two days during that election. <laughs> so, but that was truly a time where people could really, I mean, that was truly a case where it's like, oh, whoa, okay, now 537 votes out of that year, what, like 70 million people have voted? Like that really is like a very thin margin, right? Where people could have could have justifiably been angry and took to the streets for that, but they didn't, right? And so you're right. I mean, maybe I am giving people too much credit. Maybe I'm not, I don't know. My point was just that, you know, there's some unhealed trauma there. And I really do believe that these people, they feel disenfranchised, you know, like whether it's real or not, they feel it at the same time, yeah. not making excuses for them. They're old enough to know better. <laughs> yeah. And the good news is that I don't know how many of them, but quite a few of them afterwards expressed regret and having that ugliness put on public display yeah. caused a lot of people to change their minds about how they were voting. Yeah. And there were, was a wave of people changing their voter registration party affiliations across the U.S. after that because people were saying, "Is if this is what the Republican Party is going to stand for, yeah. I don't want to have any part of it because this is shaking the foundations of this country to its roots and it's pissing on the Constitution <laughs> and on the intention of our founding fathers and, in my opinion, on God's plan of all of us being equal parts of his creation. Yeah. So, you know, that's all I got to say about that. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, no, that's good. So we just thank y'all for listening as Christopher and I just kind of talked out our thoughts and and what we're feeling. And, and we do, we do want to encourage you to do something. And that is just have conversations with people about stuff like this. You know, it's like, don't feel like, oh my gosh, I don't want to talk about it because it's bringing politics or it's controversial, but just have conversations. I mean, Christopher and I, obviously we we both feel the same way on this topic, but you know, there are things that we don't agree with, agree with everything, but that's okay because we love and we respect each other. So just, if you haven't had the conversation with people and, and if the door opens, have the conversation because it, it just may change someone's mind and be willing to live in your discomfort of having those conversations you don't have to be ready for it you don't have to have studied for it you don't have to have prepared your thoughts or arguments find someone who you trust and who you have a friendship with that you've built over time open your mouth say I think I might make mistakes when I say things, or there might be things that I say that you're not going to agree with, but I'm here to learn. I'm here to open my mind, here to open my heart. Let's talk about race. Yes, I love it. Thank you all so much for listening. See you next time. Bye.